Progress and synchronization. In the last segment, Helge spoke about synchronization and the role of the synchronistic tables in the emergence of a genre of universal history. In this segment, we'll explore how synchronization has been used in the interplay between politics and historical narratives in the Ottoman Empire and later Turkey. The key concept here is progress. With Europe as a yardstick for what it means to be civilized, different societies were, in the 19th century, discursively distributed along a time axis of progress whose goal was implicitly becoming European or like Europe. In English, we often use progress, civilizing, modernization, Europeanization, and Westernization as synonyms. But in other languages and other settings, the situation is not quite as simple. In the historiography of the late Ottoman Empire and the early Turkish Republic, this is a major issue. Canonical works like those of Bernard Lewis on Yazi Berkes posit a process of westernization starting as early as the Tulip period in the first half of the 18th century. Yet, as I will come back to, it is difficult to find any stated intention to westernize at that time. The nation states that emerged from the Ottoman Empire were largely formed by an adherence to modernity as a set of political discourses and practices. Embedded in this project was a norm that a nation state should have one temporality. Its citizens should live life according to a single temporal, temporal standard, and there could be only one politically relevant historical narrative, namely that of the nation as a collective. Few of the post-Ottoman states were as ferociously devoted to secularizing temporality as the Turkish Republic. By extending the timeline of the Turks far into the past, it bracketed the Ottoman period as one of several empires founded and run by the Turks. The Ottoman Empire's greatness was detached discursively from Islam and instead linked to the ingenuity and pragmatism of the Turkish race or nation. Where the Ottoman Empire had narrated its history primarily by referring to the Ottoman dynasty as protectors of Islam, the new Turkish Republic narrated a history of Turkishness fitting all known steppe nomadic rulers and empires into its own genealogy. Narrating a story where the Ottoman sultans were written into a lineage of caliphs differs markedly from a story of how the Islamic Ottoman Empire is merely one of several incarnations of an inherently Turkic pas passage through history. It may sound like a minor reprioritization of discursive elements. I would contend, however, that we, what we today call the Turkish polity emerged as a political entity with this reprioritization. Ottoman historians and scribes related history and politics by reference to a cyclical temporality, where periods of renewal and decay came and went in a schema that can be traced to Ibn Khaldun and the Halidi Nekshebendi religious discourse of Mujedidism. Mujedidism is a form of revivalism or renewalism, if that can be a term. In a sense, this cyclicality in Ottoman history prim primarily relates to one aspect of temporality, the religious uh, well-being of the polity. The Turkish Republic challenged this cyclicality of political time while also challenging the public and political relevance of religious time as linked with salvation. Salvation was a matter for the individual, not for the body politic. The body politic was to be brought into the future. It was to progress, develop and modernize as part of a competition with other polities and finally catch up with them. Where the cyclicality of Ottoman historiography had centered on the dynasty as an upholder of certain universal and permanent principles, the linearity of Turkish historiography is centered on the Turkish nation and its passage through history. The philosophical canon that proposes this type of, universe of historical narrative is decidedly Eurocentric. Hegel is, of course, one such origin, but it is difficult to trace the influence of his writing in Ottoman and Turkish historiography. There can nevertheless be little doubt that this type of Eurocentric narrative, structured by the concepts of progress and distributing nations along a temporal axis, made its way into the Turkish language and became an important way in which the Turkish Republic narrates its community's place in the world and in world history. 
Just as European historiography was about the Christian teleology of leading to salvation or damnation prior to the 18th century, so starting with Whig history in English and Hegel's historiosophy in German, it largely became a matter of ever unfolding freedom and secular progress in the 19th and 20th centuries. The substitution of freedom for salvation as the historical goal meant that non-Christians would, at least in theory, become part of the narrative about the un universal human we, and not simply the negation of that we in European history writing. The concept of civilization and the possibility of becoming civilized, which is also formulated in historical terms, also plays a central part in this, because civilized was not necessarily synonymous with Christian, or at least not always. Few collectives have gone as far as the Turkish one when it comes to making sense of their own history in a manner synchronized with European narratives. While European historiography has similar origins and to some extent the same origins as Ottoman historiography, both coming out of a court chronicling tradition, by the 19th century the two were very different indeed. With a few noteworthy exceptions, Ottoman historiography largely consisted of chronicling events of the dynasty. While this was not the only way of writing and thinking about history, it was rather different from 18th century European historiography, which has taken away a turn away from mere chronicling, with works of such intellectuals and scholars as Herder, Hegel, Niebuhr and von Ranke leading the way. Historiography in the emerging European literature was becoming a complex field that involved not only chronicling events, but searching for historical causes and positioning the collective in a world order that need not be theological. Over a period of about a century, Ottoman historical narratives went from being chronicles centered on the Ottoman dynasty and formulated almost entirely by the use of Ottoman concepts to being formulated by the use of concepts translated from European languages and treating the Ottoman polity's place in the world and in world history, or rather in relation to European history, in the changes in conceptual vocabulary and Ottoman historical narratives in the late 19th century and twi early 20th, the concept of reform was one of several that became entangled with European political concepts and used to formulate a particular political program that entailed a particular teleological take on history. With the conclusion of peace after the Crimean War in 1856, the Ottoman Sultan proclaimed an edict that secured the legal changes required by the European states in order to accept the Ottoman Empire into the Congress of Europe. This edict, which secured all subjects formally equality before the law, was called the Islahat Fermana, the Edict of Islah. Islah is in this context usually translated as the Reform Edict. Reform was often tied to progress. Where one had in the European languages previously spoken of progress in this or that field, progresses, one now had progress as a one concept moving history. The German conceptual historian Reinhard Koselleck has argued that the conceptual changes during this period, which he calls Sattelzeit, took place in Europe between 1750 and 1850. And it happened through the appearance of collective singulars pointing towards a utopian future. These concepts, rather than having basis in some past experience, were shaped by the hopes and expectations of perfection in the future. The Ottoman concept of progress, Taraki, gained importance during the middle of the 19th century. Like in the European languages, it started out as progresses in the plural, but soon coalesced into a collective singular. As early as 1852, one Ottoman intellectual spoke of the road to, of progress, that one might walk together with the civilized nations of Europe. This may be a very early example, but Taraki was becoming a key concept that one could not do without in the political debates of the 1860s and 70s. Like any other identity, modernity needs a constitutive outside in order to delineate a collective and to become meaningful. Since modernity has been usually uh, formulated as European modernity, that outside was originally Europe, Europe's outside. A barbarian East with Russia and the Ottoman Empire as key others, vis-a-vis -vis whom Europe differentiated its own identity. 
In a celebrated book, Colonizing Egypt, the British anthropologist Timothy Mitchell argues that the introduction of a European order in Egypt depended on keeping and margin marginalizing remnants of the old one. The old disorder was constitutive of the new order, first introduced by the French, but always reliant on joint action between local authorities and European intervention for its realization. And this order could only be intelligible if the Orient was there to be seen and to make the new order recognizably distinct. The modernization of Egypt thus depended on the re-representation of the old as Oriental and the new as Western or at least as modern. These old re remnants can be seen by all and can be relegated to specific parts of the city, specific social practices and particular classes of people by linking them to disorder or tradition. The Ottoman modernization project involved a, an appropriation of the same European Orientalist discourse that gave meaning to an order disorder dichotomy in Egypt. And the application of this discourse in differentiating between an Ottoman metropolitan self, which was orderly, civilized and modern, from the Ottoman peripheral other, Arabs, which basically meant Bedouins, and Turks, meaning country bumpkins and Turkmen nomads. If we take the Levant as something that encompasses Salonika, Izmir and Istanbul, this was originally a matter of a Levant-centered, cosmopolitan and largely urban identity that differentiated itself vis-a-vis -vis the landlocked provinces. Rather than a, a clear linguistic divide between Turkish and Arabic. Turks and Arabs were equally negative categories. This was originally not a matter of Anatolia versus Arab provinces, but of Medeniet as civilization or urbanity versus Bedeviet, nomadism or Bedouinism. Central to what became an internal Ottoman mission civilisatrice was the Firka Islahiya, the Reform Brigade, which was responsible for settling nomads in the Ottoman hinterland. The relationship was set up as one between metropole and colony, and one where the temporal axis of development, whereby the periphery could and should become like the metropole. After what later became known as the Young Turk Revolution of 1908, the dichotomy of new and old was given a particularly political slant. The old was discursively linked to oppression or tyranny, and the new was linked to freedom. This dichotomy was associated with the regimes of Sultan Abdul Hamid and the Committee of Union and Progress, respectively. In textbooks prepared for the new civic education program, the Hamadian period was represented as the Ancien Regime. The period was linked to the concept of absolute rule which was said to be the most primitive form of government. Moreover, it was stated that countries that are governed by absolute rule cannot progress. Similarly, the people who were behind the failed 31 March incident in 1909, when a mob tried to reinstate Abdul Hamid II's absolute rule, were represented as reactionary, irtijai, while the CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress, represented progress. Abdul Hamid II's rule was absolutist and therefore against progress, and the people supporting him were reactionaries. This placed the Ottoman dynasty and its supporters, which included both the religious establishment and most of the non-urban peasantry, firmly in the category of reaction. With the increased emphasis on Arab identity in the Ottoman parliament after 1908, and especially with the Arab revolt of 1917, these two dichotomies of new and old and Ottoman center and periphery were in Ottoman discourses overlain with one of Turks versus Arabs. Though within these collectives, the center periphery relationship remained unchanged. Arabness and Turkishness increasingly became concepts that essentialized traits and that were constituted in opposition to one another. In Turkish discourse, the Arabs were assigned the same character traits as Orientals were in European discourse. This tendency was further intensified after the abolition of the Sultanate, a move in which not only the Hamadian regime, but the Ottoman Empire itself was othered as Oriental. The Ottoman Empire was used as a temporal other against which the modernizing and westernizing Kemalist pro political project defined itself, as some still do today. The European representations of the Ottoman Empire's eastern, stagnant, backward and corrupt 
were adopted wholesale by the Kemalists and applied to their predecessors and political rivals within the country alike. The Committee of Union and Progress leadership centered on Anwar, Jamal and Talat Pasha, the former sultans Fatah ed din and Abdul Hamid II, and reactionaries, such as those behind the Manaman incident in 1930, when the Naqshbandi incited a crowd by calling to, for the restoration of the caliphate. These were all conflated and represented as aspects of the same phenomenon, irtija, reaction. Irtija was to be found mainly in the periphery of the country, but also in Istanbul, which was the seat of the Ottoman dynasty and thus stood in a dichotomous opposition to Ankara, the home of the nationalists. It was also something that could be used by foreign states intent on weakening, dividing and ruling Turkey. The Young Turks' representation of the Ahmadian Ancien Regime as a temporal other can be broadened to a more general point about Ottoman Turkish history 1900 to 1950, namely that following each of the political transformations of 1908, 1919 to 24 and 1950, the new rulers othered the preceding leadership in such a way that they not only represented their predecessors as forces of reaction, they also to some extent conflated them with spatial others. In his 1932 memoir Zeytindar, The Olive Mountain, the Kemalist intellectual Fali Rifgatay conflated the previous leadership with which he had been closely associated with the East. Ottoman history became a world of lies. In the East, lies are not considered shameful. Moreover, the Ottoman statesman Talat Bey, like many of the men of the constitutional regime, was an Eastner. He was an Eastner who didn't even have the varnish of the Tansimat. The Ottoman past was Eastern, deceitful and corrupt. And this corruption and Easterness were linked to such places as Baghdad and Egypt. Although it never supplanted all the other temporalities found in Turkish society, the Turkish nation state was fairly successful in replacing a narrative centered on the Ottoman dynasty as Islamic rulers with Turks as a nomadic tribe on an east-west journey through history. Thus, the Turkish Republic succeeded in melting together an essentialized pseudo Kulturnation with the westward historical movement that was implicit in the modernization project. The nomads served as a chronotope that united progress in history with constancy of a Turkish ethne, alluding to the fact that it is possible to remain true to oneself while also moving through history and adapting to the conditions. Although it may be giving weight in scholarly works, the type of historical narrative used to give Ottoman Turkish history meaning has a strongly teleological component that seems to be partly at the translation of European narrative histories about the Ottoman polity. These teleologies have become a central part not only of history writing, but also of Turkish political discourse. And they were, at least up until a few years ago, used to legitimize a wide range of political decisions and initiatives. Although the current government now seems to challenge it, the hegemonic narrative of Turkish progress and historical development still maintains an east-west dichotomy that overlaps with the reaction-progress dichotomy. Reaction is in the east and progress is still in the west or rather towards the west. However socially conservative and politically authoritarian some of them may be, Turks inhabiting the Aegean coast are generally represented as progressive, while people further east in the country are generally represented as either conservative or reactionary. 